Good afternoon and welcome to Cotswold District Council's live Q&A. This is the second Q&A we've had after our first very successful edition last week. Thank you for all the feedback and comment um, we've had to that and to, for the excellent questions. My name is Councillor Joe Harris and I am the leader of Cotswold District Council. I am joined today by Councillor Mike Evermey, who is our Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Finance. I'm also joined by Councillor Lisa Spivey, who is our Cabinet Member for Housing and Homelessness. Welcome to you both and thank you for joining me. I want to start by thanking the Barn Theatre for making um, this arrangement possible. They do fantastic work in our community and have really diversified since having to uh, shut their doors since the coronavirus lockdown began a few weeks ago. I also want to start by saying a big thank you to all of our staff in the NHS who are working so hard we owe you a huge debt of gratitude and it won't be forgotten. I also want to thank our care workers, our key workers, and indeed our council staff who have been going above and beyond to ensure that services function as normally as possible at this very, very difficult time. Today as well, I want to send the Prime Minister our very best wishes. As I'm sure you all know, he was admitted to intensive care last night. Prime Minister, our thoughts are with you and your family. And whatever our political differences, we wish you a very swift recovery. And we'll be with you today for a bit between 45 minutes and an hour. And we're going to split um, into a number of sections. First of all, we're going to hear from Lisa and from Mike just about what they've been doing in their respective areas. And we're also going to hear questions in advance after that. So that's questions that have been submitted in advance of this meeting, either on the Facebook page, Twitter, or to, uh, to me in email. We're then going to hear from another couple of my colleagues, um, ask, answering, uh, my apologies, asking, um, answering some queries about um, waste and the volunteering effort and just really giving a bit of a general update. We're also then going to hear from Borton on the Water, where they've seen a fantastic volunteering effort. I'm talk I did a pre-recorded interview with um, Donna Holland, who's one of the volunteers there, so we'll be hearing from her and what they've been getting up to in Borton on the Water. And then we're going to live questions. That's questions that have been submitted during the course of this broadcast and went very successfully last week and I'm sure it will go very successfully again. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to hand over first to Mike Evermey, who won the toss um, to go first. Mike, let's hear a little from you about finances, uh, grants and support available to businesses and residents. Mike. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I think there are two key messages that I'd like to get across this afternoon. Uh, the first one is around businesses and we as a council are here to support you uh, as much as we can through this process. Uh, the government has announced a variety of schemes uh, for doing that. We're responsible for administering a grants scheme and a business rates relief scheme. We've written to 2,800 businesses across the district who are eligible for a grant under the scheme. Uh, and 900 of those so far have come back with a form. Uh, until we have the form back from the other 1,900 businesses, we won't be able to pay them the grants that the government have given us £37 million to pay out to businesses in the district to help them through this really difficult time. So for business uh, owners, business managers out there, please make sure if you haven't already, you get that form into us. If you are, think you may be eligible or you know you're eligible, please send that form in and then our staff uh, can get, get the money out to you uh, as a matter of urgency. Uh, they made the first uh, payments out out yesterday and they're working flat out to get those payments out to the 900 who have already uh, sent their forms into us. The second thing I wanted to say was around uh, council tax. 
uh, and people who are having difficulty, if anyone watching this broadcast or you know of anyone who is having difficulty with their council tax, then please do ask them to make contact with us. Uh, we have a new local council tax support scheme, uh, which we uh, put through this year, which is more generous than the previous scheme. And we want to make sure if people don't have enough income to pay their council tax, uh, that they're getting the full maximum disregard on that that they can. So please encourage them uh, to uh, similarly uh, fill in that form, get in touch with us, ring us up, uh, and get the, uh, the support they're entitled to. I'm sure I'll come back on other things later, later on. Thank you, Mike. Um, that's very useful to, uh, to kick us off. Um, over now to Lisa. Lisa, you are responsible for housing and homelessness. Uh, yes, that's right. And actually, at this time, I think the need for a safe, secure home has never been more relevant. And I have to say, in a certain respect, um, our housing team at Cotswold District Council, very much for them, this is business as usual, if, if somewhat at a more accelerated rate, in that we are doing our utmost to make sure that everybody who needs accommodation is found accommodation. Uh, this is especially relevant for any of our rough sleepers. I know there's been quite a few questions about that and I just want to assure everybody out there that, that we are doing our utmost to make sure that those who uh, need uh, accommodation, including the rough sleepers, have been offered accommodation and will be continued to be offered accommodation. Uh, we've also been working very closely with our uh, housing associations here in the Cotswolds to make sure that uh, tenants are secure in their homes and that they, uh, anybody who is requiring uh, emergency or temporary accommodation that can be found using uh, voids and uh, we'll be direct matching as much as we can um, as the uh, coronavirus uh, takes its toll on, on our district and those the, who need support, will, uh, we, will, we will find it for you and we, uh, like Mike said, uh, any information you need is on our website. Please do get in contact with us if you have a family member or indeed yourself are in need of, of accommodation at this time. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we'll hear more from Lisa in a second. Right, uh, without further ado then, let's go to some of the pre-prepared questions that have been submitted to us in um, advance. Uh, the first one is from Rob Derry, and that was on Facebook to, to Mike. Uh, Mike, um, this is from Rob. CDC are offering payment deferments to people paying by cash because the office is closed. I'm talking about council tax payments. Will this be extended to everyone so that council tax payments can be made June to March instead of April to January? This will help many over the next couple of months, which hopefully will be the worst of it. Um, thanks, Rob, for your question. Uh, we've made that offer to uh, people who have no other way effectively of paying us other than in cash because uh, in the past they could come into either the office in Sirencester or in Morton uh, and uh, pay in cash. Uh, so we're making that available uh, that they can pay, move the instalments for April and May back to the back end of the year, but they need to ring us and tell us that that's what they're intending to do. So similarly, if there are other people who are struggling to pay, I'll go back to what I said before. In the first instance, people should, uh, and if they have a, had a reduction in their income, if they have no income, they should look to reduce uh, the council tax that they're paying through the support scheme. If, uh, <clears throat> obviously, that, that's the, the best way, because then they'll be paying less overall. Um, if people have a difficulty in terms of their cash flow, uh, but they think they will have money later in the year, they need to ring us and tell us that, uh, and, our, and our staff at the council will do what they can uh, to, to accommodate. But ultimately, we get in the April and May, we're going to have £15 million worth of uh, money coming in. We're due in on council tax. And that money goes to the vital services that are being provided, particularly vital at this time. Care for uh, adults, uh, older people who are, uh, need care, children's services to look after vulnerable young people, the waste collection service, the police. Uh, many, many other services are being funded from your council tax. So for those of us who can, who have an income, who can keep paying, we must keep paying our council tax. If you have any difficulty, then get in touch with us. Thank you, Mike. I'm sure we'll come back to that um, shortly. Uh, what we'll do, we'll go straight over to you, Lisa. I've um, got a question from John Clack in Sirencester via Facebook. Um, rough sleepers are still on the streets of Sirencester. Please, can you explain why? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think I alluded to that in, in my introduction. I can assure you that anybody who is rough sleeping that we know about has been spoken to and offered accommodation. Uh, that is our duty. We do that uh, anyway, and we continue to do that. The unfortunate truth is that for some people, the accommodation on offer is not what they want to have. Um, we will 
our outreach workers will continue to, to go out to them uh, and offer accommodation. But at this point, the police and neither we nor the police have powers to force anybody into accommodation. So sometimes, if, for example, we don't have accommodation in Sirencester where somebody wants to be and they're offered somewhere which uh, is a bit further afield, then they might not want to take it. So, But I can assure you that everybody has been offered accommodation. Thank you, Lisa. Um, question to me now. This is from Dan Newham-Turner um, via email. Um, like many local residents, we have been horrified and dismayed at the continual threat of erosion and scaling back um, of Sirencester Hospital. The blood testing service is safe for now, but may not be for long. We are fortunate to have a minor injuries unit and paramedic team stationed in our town. The pressure on the nation's finances after this pandemic are going to be at an unimaginable scale. What influence or action are the council able to take in protecting the most vulnerable and cherished asset to our regional population? Well, we know that our community hospitals um, for the past few years um, have been eroded. I think, don't think there's any other way of putting it. Um, there's been reorganisation and a lot, a lot of this strategy is to, um, is to centralise a lot of the services at the at Gloucester Hospital and in our major population centres. Clearly this pandemic has raised a whole new set of questions about resilience and what we need to be doing. So you, you'll know the District Council have been really good in the past at sort of beating the drum for, for North Cotswold Hospital in Morton and indeed Cotswold District Council when we've seen um, planned service reductions and we will continue to ensure that we've got a resilient health service um, in the Cotswolds. All councillors across, across party lines at the District Council all agree that we should be upgrading and enhancing our community hospitals, not eroding them and downgrading them. So you have it from me, and I'm pretty sure I can speak for all councillors of the District Council, that we will fight tooth and nail to ensure that our fantastic community hospitals, and indeed our local NHS in all its forms, are as strong and as resilient as they, as they can be. Thank you for that question, Dan. Um, I'm going to go now to another question from, who have we got? We have got, let's find another one for you, shall we, Mike? I know we'll break you in easily. How about that? Um, this is from Rob Gibson to, to Mike Evermy. So please could you review the residential council tax as it has increased by 4.1% this financial year. Council tax is used to support CDC costs and is not um, funded by central government. With the current emergency salary funding support which is being paid by central government, those staff at CDC who will be furloughed will have 80% of their salaries supported. Further to this, with, um, further to this, with reduced services, garden waste, waste now cancelled, and other services reduced due to non-availability of staff, a reduction in council tax is an understandable request. It has been stated that council tax can be deferred February, um, February to February, March 2021, but as people have less income, this is not a reduction and or support for those who have less or no income. Full payment is um, still due, just delayed. Mike. Okay. Uh, obviously, I asked the question, answered the question about deferral earlier. Um, just to clarify, no Cotswold District Council staff are being furloughed, no staff in local government or in national government, in my understanding, are being furloughed. The scheme is not available for uh, council officers. But our council officers who aren't working on frontline services, and most of them are, most of them are supporting, as Lisa says, uh, in housing and homelessness, in the benefits system, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, in providing uh, services such as the waste collection service. But for those who aren't, they're supporting the community resilience effort that's going on across the Cotswolds. I'm sure we'll hear more from Jenny Ford about that later. Um, I think it's, it's, it's just worth uh, reminding and telling people that um, actually the council is currently at least uh, losing at least a third of a million pounds a month uh, out of its budget for every month that this uh, crisis and the lockdown continues. Uh, so we as a council are, are you know, looking at potentially, if this lasts for three months, a million pound deficit on our budget of 24 million pounds. So whilst we might all like a reduction in our council tax, uh, we do have, we have plans, we have budgets, all of the councils have. Uh, the collection that we make, most of the collection goes to the Gloucestershire County Council and the police, uh, who similarly need the money to provide the vital services uh, that, they, that they give to the, the residents of our district. So. If you need support, then ask for it. Otherwise, you need to pay your tax, I think is the message. Thanks, Mike. Um, one for you, Lisa. Um, this is from uh, Nikki Vivian on Facebook. Um, to you, Lisa. Is anything going to be done about people who are travelling here to stay in their second homes? Um, in this instance, she's talking specifically about the homes on the lakes around the Cotswold Water Park. 
Uh, yes, so obviously the government advice has been very clear on this, and that is to stay at home in your primary residence. Uh, Travelling to a second home anywhere in the country is not essential travel. So we are, uh, of course, following those guidelines and advice, and now, in fact, the law. Uh, we've been actively promoting that over the last week. I don't know if you've seen um, on Facebook, on Twitter, on all sorts of channels, uh, to make sure that we're getting that message across, that people at this point are not welcome in the Cotswolds in their second homes. Um, as a council, we don't actually have any uh, enforcement uh, power that is the job of the police. Um, however, we, like I say, we're definitely making a, a very proactive campaign um, to, to discourage anybody from coming here. And we will be in due course uh, speaking to the main um, providers of holiday homes uh, across the water park in particular to make sure that they are aware of all of these rules and are also following that up. Thank you, Lisa. One of the things that came out of last week's broadcast is a sort of desire to hear about what's happening around the Cotswolds in the various communities. I spoke earlier to Donna Holland, who's helping to lead the volunteering effort, or at least playing a very big role um, in Borton on the Water. Here's a pre-recorded interview I did with Donna earlier. I'm joined now by Donna Holland, um, who's a volunteer in Borton on the Water. Uh, my colleagues and I are very aware of the good work that's been happening in Borton on the Water. Um, so, so well done to the community there. Donna, can you just um, start by telling us what's happening in Borton on the Water? Um, what are you guys doing in your community? So uh, we set up around the 14th of March a WhatsApp group to start discussing the fact that we would almost definitely need to be doing something to help people if they had to self-isolate the vulnerable, uh, the elderly. Um, so uh, we started chatting then. We then met on the 17th of March, a smaller group of us of about 10, creating a subgroup. Um, and by the end of that week, which was the 21st, 22nd of March, we had printed by the fabulous Kevin Bird, thousands of uh, Borton on the Water Street volunteer leaflets. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they were that they had the bridge on and they were specific to our village that they couldn't be copied. There was a lot of kind of safeguarding issues that we wanted to make sure that uh, people would never take advantage on our patch. Fantastic. And how have you, have you found the response in the, in the community? Have you had lots of volunteers or people eager, eager sorry, to, to get involved? So we had a sign up weekend at the Croft, which is my little restaurant on the patio with lots of social distancing, lots of all the measures that we had to take that, that weekend. And we ended up with 130 volunteers in total. We married it for two to three volunteers per postcode. Uh, logistically, that was really difficult. The two councillors that have been in charge of that are Amanda Davies and Linda Hicks, um, who both are on our parish council. They have juggled the most incredible task to get what are about 1,800 homes married up with these 130 street volunteers. So that is 4,500 people that now have between two and three street volunteers that they can call upon should they need it. Fantastic. And, and what, what, what are the sort of main things that volunteers are doing in your community? Does that tend to be a specific job um, helping a particular um, set of the community? So I will tell you what I do for my little um, postcode. So I went around and introduced myself to them all because I was dealing with um, uh, an older generation. So I thought it'd be quite nice if they saw my face. So I did that at a, at a safe distance uh, using all the correct measures. Um, I do shopping for them. So I do that maybe two or three times a week. Um, I have a chat with them on the telephone. Lots of them live on their own. So it's quite nice to... Uh, have a cup of tea together so we, we often do that um, we have lots of little subgroups again because there are so many houses in Bolton and some of these subgroups have set up other um, little groups to pick up prescriptions or so that we're not all going to the chemist and standing in a great big queue one person will pick up for two or three two or three postcodes if that makes sense Fantastic. And finally, what would your advice be? Obviously, we've got lots of people from all over the Cotswolds um, watching. 
What would your advice be to communities that perhaps aren't, aren't as advanced um, in their sort of volunteer schemes as you guys are? Well, give us a shout. Ask us. We'll happily share any of the infrastructure, any, any of our information, anything we've learned from this, because it's been a roller coaster for the last three weeks. But uh, by all means, contact any of us in Bolton and we'll happily help you where we can set it up. Donna, thank you so much for joining us. As I said, we will we will put out your details and the details of the group um, on, on our Facebook page. But yeah, well done to you, well done to all the volunteers, Parish Council, Nick Maunda, your local district councillor, a really, really fantastic team over in Bourton on the Water. I have a, I have a huge list of people to... Go, go on then, thank, give, us a, give, us a, give us a few of those people, go on. <laughs> so, uh, we have Councillor Amanda Davis, we have Councillor Linda Hicks, we have Leanne Launchbury, we have Kevin Bird. We have Jacqueline Wright, who I believe is your health and well-being manager at CDC. She has opened many doors and showed, lot, shared lots of information with us. We've got the churches. They've been fabulous in reaching out to some of the more vulnerable or people who are not on the social media. So that's been a huge, um, you know, that's been really good to be able to communicate with that, that um, sector. Um, the co-op in Bolton, you know, from Phil Ponsby at the top, Adam Quinton, our area manager, and Adam Withers, who's the store manager, they have created um, the vulnerable shopping hours. They have created special delivery. I mean, the co-op don't do delivery, but they have created special delivery for the vulnerable or people who are self-isolating. Um, Cotswold Friends, they have been amazing as well, so hooking us all up with services that are forever changing as business are evolving. And I'm sure I've missed out <laughs> loads of people, but this is a huge community effort. This is not about one or two people. This is a massive Bolton on the Water community effort, and I applaud everybody who's got involved and everybody who stayed at home because that is also a huge involvement. Donna, thank you so much for joining us and um, we look forward to seeing the fantastic work that you're going to continue to do in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Donna Holland there from Boughton on the Water. Every week we're going to try and feature a different community and highlight the good work that um, they're doing. So if you'd like, if you know a group in your, a group of people or, or some individuals in your community that you'd like to feature and think deserve a bit of credit, then please get in touch, comment in the comments section or pop me an email and we will, uh, we will try and feature them over the coming weeks. But I think the thing to say is there's been so, much fun, so many fantastic examples across the Cotswolds. We can all be proud to live in an area where our residents care so much about each other. Absolutely fantastic. Straight after that, then we're going to we're going to head right now to a again a pre-recorded piece I did with Councillor Jenny Ford earlier, talking about the um, volunteering effort and a lot of the stuff that the communities are doing um, in our area. Jenny, good to have you on the line. Can you just give us a brief update of what the council have been doing over the past week since we last spoke to you um, last week? Yes, of course. Um, there's a there's two thank yous I really want to do today to two groups in particular. Um, First of all, I want to say a huge thank you to all the officers at Cotswold District Council. Um, they, get a, they get a lot of stick and it's easy to moan, but we have to remember that they, they are public service um, servants and um, the residents should be really reassured to know that every one of those officers is committed to doing all they can to support everybody. They've been working 24-7 all through the weekends, many of them with young families, many of them trying to homeschool and keep, um, you know, support their families and other loved ones going, um, but doing all that they can, um, often, um, you know, being redeployed across different disciplines and working in areas that they're not so familiar with because they all want to help. Um, so I just wanted to say that really, um, and many of them um, have have come up with some really um, compassionate stories. I just wanted to give you an example. There's actually um, an elderly lady um, turning, well, I say elderly, she's turning 101 tomorrow. Um, and it's a really sad story. I just want to read you the um, email that I got from the officer. And she said, I feel so sorry and sad for this lady. I really want something to happen for her birthday. She must be so lonely and grieving for her daughter whose funeral she can't even attend. 101 years and still living independently is such an achievement. Um, if nobody can, I'm happy to drive there myself 
with balloons and a large happy birthday placard and stand outside her window and deliver her a cake. And I'm not joking either. And actually, what's happened is since we got that email, um, they, she has actually arranged for that to happen. And she's going round to that woman's house tomorrow in Sirencester to stand outside her house and sing happy birthday to her. And I just think that's such a good example of the compassion um, and hard work and dedication and commitment to our residents that our officers are displaying. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. And then secondly, I want to say a huge thank you to our residents in the Cotswolds. They have been phenomenal. Um, and our community resilience and support is working really well right across the Cotswolds. I know it sounds really cliched, but we really are all in this together and people are working really very well. Um, supporting people in the best ways they can with our phenomenal support um, systems such as the food banks and Cotswold Friends and the Churn Project and the Citizens Advice Bureau. We could not do it without those people. Um, and then just to say a final reminder that if you do need any help or if you want to volunteer, don't forget the Gloucestershire Help Hub. Um, all of the people that we're helping and supporting and, and sending in the direction of of help are coming through this Gloucestershire Help Hub. Um, I'm sure we can um, give you the um, web address, but the number, if you need it, is 01452 583 519. Um, and that's what I wanted to say, Joe. really. I just wanted to remind people that, there are, that, the, that we're all in this together, but also that there are lots of people working really, really hard um, with compassion. And I ask people to remember that and I know it's a bit cliched that we're in this together, but um, everyone needs to exercise a bit of kindness and tolerance and understanding as we go through this time. Thank you, Jenny. I've got one question um, for you, if you don't mind, that we've had in advance. This is from Holly Wright, who lives in, in Morton in the North Cotswolds. Um, Holly's autistic and she wants to know what help there is for people with autism in the Cotswolds. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. That's a really good question. I'm not actually sure off the top of my head. Um, I should imagine if uh, it depends what support she needs. Um, I will take that and, and um, we'll get um, to, we'll speak to one of our officers. And it may be that that's um, a, an issue for the Gloucestershire Help Hub. But we will certainly do our best to get some answers for Holly. Holly, what I'll do is I'll make sure that you have Jenny's email so you can contact her directly and we'll get you that help. Thank you, Jenny, and um, speak to you again next week. OK, thank you. And as if by magic, the headphones disappear. Um, right, we're going, to, we're going to take some more questions now, um, and then we're going to get an update from Councillor Andrew Doherty on the Waste Service, because I know many of you are asking questions about the, about the Waste Service. Um, so uh, this one for you, Lisa, and again, sort of touches on what we were talking about earlier around holiday homes. Um, last week, you were tackling the issue of people visiting their second homes in the Cotswolds, um, despite the government's ban on non-essential travel. It's so disappointing that some local owners, agents of holiday accommodation in the Cotswolds are still advertising availability in their properties for this week over the Easter weekend and beyond. I'm aware that some accommodation could be being made available for the use of frontline staff who may need to isolate away from their families. However, there are luxurious cottages being advertised at prices far out of reach for such workers. Advertising availability of such luxury accommodation in the Cotswolds seemingly encourages people to flout the government ban on non-essential travel. What are your thoughts on this, Lisa? Well, I mean, like I said before, I, I, I absolutely agree. And the government advice has been, uh, uh, was been very, very clear about not coming to the Cotswolds. It's not something that we would normally want to be saying, um, don't come here. Obviously, we normally have open arms to visitors to the Cotswolds. But at this time, the message is clear, do not come here. And in fact, the uh, Coronavirus Act has made the letting, holiday lettings uh, illegal at the moment. And so, therefore, uh, this is not something that anybody should be doing and whether the individuals should be taking down those adverts or perhaps even the sites which offer uh, accommodation should perhaps be uh, suspended for the moment uh, is sort of open to debate obviously for the future and when this lockdown is um, re relaxed then we will be obviously hoping to have many visitors back in the Cotswolds but for right now Please, everyone, stay in your primary res residence, stay at home and come back when there is freedom of movement. 
Thank you, Lisa. And I think it's worth um, worth saying that Jeffrey Clifton Brown, the MP for the Cotswolds, has one of these Q and A sessions on a Friday. So quite a quite a lot of issues sort of touch the council, but equally they need a government response. So do tune into that if you get the opportunity, and make sure that um, you're asking Jeffrey any questions that um, that, that need answering. Um, I've got another question, and we did say that we'd answer every question, um, no matter how strange they might seem. So I've got one from Tom on Facebook to me. Can we have some clarification on whether Cotswold District Council deem Cadbury Easter eggs an essential item? Quite frankly, I do. <laughs> I'm, I mean, other brands are available. I like Cadbury's very much. Um, but I would say that Easter eggs are an essential item. But, but, here's the, here's, here's the key point. Make sure you're not just going out to buy them on their own. Make sure you're doing it as part of a, um, a bigger shop and make sure that you're following the government's social distancing rules, so staying two metres apart from people. But, Tom, in answer to your question, absolutely, I would say that Easter eggs are an essential item. What about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, I think, think my son would think so. Excellent. Lisa? Absolutely. Undoubtedly, yes. Excellent. So, so there you go, Tom. Easter eggs are an essential item, so you have, you have permission. Um, <laughs> right, OK. Um, what we'll do now, I think what we'll do now, we will go to Councillor Andrew Doherty. This is a piece I recorded earlier. Um, Andrew couldn't be here um, today. Um, so this is an update on the waste service. Um, and then we'll go to our live Q&A and answer the questions that you've been asking during this broadcast. So um, here's Andrew Doherty. Andy, thanks for joining us. And thank you uh, for the questions that you answered last week. I know lots of residents find it very useful. Um, if I can just give you the opportunity just for a few minutes, just to give us a bit of an update on the waste service, where we're at as of today, and what's happening over the next week or so. OK, so as of this week, we think we're managing to do all of the collections as we normally would, with the exception of garden waste, which is still suspended. And I'll come back on to that in a moment. We had extra collections all of last week and we had extra collections on Saturday. And from those, we think we've picked up the majority of the service failures, as we call them, which is where we couldn't get everything on the vehicles usually. Uh, and we've also picked up the vast majority of the misses. So we're where we might have missed an individual house. There's probably still some lurking. So those we're still trying to get round to. But the main objective over the weekend has been to try and get ourselves back on top of things and be up to date with all of the collections. There's a few particular things going on for different types of collections. There's still a lot of food waste coming out, much more than would normally be the case. So if you see the crews out and about, you will see extra lorries out with them. And those extra lorries are picking up food waste. And we've got some much bigger lorries out picking out food waste, for example. The next problem we're having is with the amount of cardboard and plastic that you've got going out. Essentially, we can only fit on a certain amount on the vehicles, and if the vehicle has to leave and go off to empty again, then we run out of time to do all of our collections. So what we really need you to know is that we're only going to collect the plastic and cardboard and other recycling that will fit inside the containers that we provide. So if you put out lots of extra cardboard, we're not going to take it. If you put out lots of extra plastic, we're not going to be able to take it. And that's simply because we don't have the room. And to make sure we get around everybody, we need to manage what's on the vehicle as well. So try and pack all your cardboard well, try and squeeze and deal with your plastic packaging and keep everything inside the boxes and containers that we provide. We've also got a slight problem ongoing with a lot of people who aren't sorting out their recycling properly. It's a particular issue to make sure that you're putting the right things into the white bag and that you're separating out your glass and paper across the two black recycling boxes that you should have. The crews do not have time to do it. They can't do it for you. So if it's not sorted properly when they get there, they're likely to put a sticker on it saying they're not taking it for that exact reason. Um, we've got a lot of residual waste. So that's your black wheelie bin waste coming through. So we've got extra vehicles going out to do that. And again, although it might seem like a nice time to do a spring clean, we really can't cope with the extra waste that that produces. So we need you to manage and keep within the limits of what you can fit inside the black wheelie bins that you already have. On the garden waste front, obviously that remains suspended at the minute. And we don't have a time frame for when that can start once more. All of the crews and vehicles who are actually available, who are not off sick or self-isolating or looking after family members, those crews and vehicles that aren't doing garden waste are out supporting the rest of the service. So that's where we're getting the extra vehicles from to be able to do things like the food collections 
and collect things like additional cardboard and plastic that's not going on the normal vehicles. One issue that's come up for all the crews at the minute is please do not put your used tissues in your recycling boxes in with the paper. It's unhygienic, it's the wrong thing to do at the best of times, and these are not the best of times and it's causing the crews a lot of concern. Used tissues aren't recyclable anyway, they need to go in with your residual waste. And if you're in a household that's got any isolation going on because of a suspected COVID-19 case, then you really must follow the Public Health England guidelines on disposing of your personal waste. So cleaning, cloths, used tissues, those kinds of things, they must go in a separate bag. You must seal that bag and then you must leave it somewhere separately for 72 hours to make sure the virus dies off before it goes in your black waste bin. Please don't put that material anywhere else. Um, other than that, we're working to try and keep the service going uh, to the maximum extent. Uh, crews, again, very appreciative of the thanks they've had from you. But again, if you want, for example, to give the crews a thank you card, please don't come up to them and hand it over. Remember the social distancing rules. So put it somewhere, point them at it, whatever you like to do, but keep your distance when you're doing that kind of thing. Uh, that's it for the updates. Any questions, please send through to us again as normal. Thank you, Andy. And I've got a couple of questions um, for you before I do. I think it's important um, that once again we put on record our thanks for all of our crews who are on the front line and everybody supporting them. Um, and, and indeed yourself, Andy, because I know you've been working tireless hours. So well done to everybody. And we, we absolutely, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you all for, for, for the efforts. Um, a couple of questions then. Uh, these have come, come sort of via Facebook over the past few days. Um, in some areas, Andy, um, residents are a bit miffed as... <coughs> Some of, the, some of the crews will come and pick up a bin and then it will, it will appear that a bin a few doors down, they won't. Is there, sort of, is, there, is there anything to that or is it just a perception? It just seems to be a bit, a bit peculiar and a few residents have mentioned it. Um, well, for most people, kind of reality is what happens to you. So if there's a systematic problem in area, then generally we will know about that and we'll be back to deal with that. Um, there are cock-ops and there are errors. We've obviously got the updated rounds that have gone out. <clears throat> Excuse me, and some people have kind of raised questions about why we've done that. Um, and it's probably worth saying that if we hadn't been launching the new service, we'd have still had problems, but different problems, because a lot of the old rounds were too big for the number of properties on them anymore. So there'll be some problems where a crew is not necessarily completely familiar with a new round or a new area. And if your bin's in a tricky place, it's not at the front of your house, it's at the back or vice versa, they may miss it. Those kinds of things are what we will talk about as misses. Ring in and report them. And if it's clear that it is a proper miss, then we'll try and deal with that and get back to you as quickly as we can. And of course, residents can report a missed bin collection online. And that's actually really handy, isn't it, Andy? Because that gives us an idea of um, where some of the problem points are, as well as, um, as well as emailing yourself. Yeah, we can only fix what we know about. Uh, and it's very useful for us at the minute if you can report things like misses online because the customer services team are all very busy, particularly with dealing with grants and support for council tax and those kinds of other things that are essential to do at the minute. So if you can do stuff online, that's really, really helpful for us. Andy, uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much um, for everything that you guys are doing once again. And thank you for answering residents' questions both last week um, and at the minute. And I'm sure you'll get many more in the, in the days and weeks to come. Thanks, Andy. Okay, thanks. Right, so we come now to our live Q&A se um, section where we answer the questions that you've been submitting during this, um, during this broadcast. So the first one we've got is from Michelle Milliner, who is an estate agent in Sirencester and actually does fantastic work in the community and I know recently has been um, working hard um, to make sure vulnerable people have what they need and just generally helping out and mucking in. Um, so thank you for that, Michelle. Um, this is to Mike. Um, Mike, it's around the business um, grants. How long does it take to process? Uh, so we had the money uh, through from the government uh, last week. Uh, 37 million pounds came into our account on Wednesday. As I mentioned earlier, we've already sent the first payments out yesterday. Uh, so if Michelle, if your form is in, if you're entitled to one of these grants, we're endeavoring to get that money uh, out of our account by Friday for everyone that's uh, got it in by the end of last week. And obviously everyone else who's a business who hasn't already sent that in, who thinks they may be eligible, uh, our staff, this is their, their top priority in uh, uh, alongside the council tax benefit. So get the forms in. They're turning them around as fast as they can. Now the money's in. 
Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, this is from, I assume this is the same Donna Holland who we heard, heard from earlier. Um, hello, Donna, if you're, if you're watching. Do we need to send the form back if we did it online, scanned and emailed back? Uh, no, that means you've done it, Donna. Thank you. Uh, right, um, next question is from Barry Parsons, who I think lives in, uh, lives in Kemble, or certainly around Sirencester. Many of our good friends, and indeed their governments in Southeast Asia, are adamant that wearing face masks is an essential preventative measure for everyone outside their home. Several countries have now made this a legal requirement. Gov.uk and Public Health England advise only if you have the virus or are caring for someone who has. How can advice be so different, and what is your and the CDC view on this, please? Well, Barry, I think it's a really good, um, really good question, and I think we've all been reading in the press, haven't we, how attitudes towards sort of face masks seem to be changing as we learn more about how effective they are. I think, from my point of view, though, it's really important that we listen to the advice of Public Health England and the government, and I'm sure that they are constantly reviewing how effective they are. But in terms of, um, in terms of me, Mike and Lisa, and the rest of our colleagues, follow the Public Health England's guidelines. Um, so I think... You know, I'd, I would defer to them. I wouldn't want to sort of undermine or, or give anybody the wrong impression. But yeah, I mean, as you say, um, if, you've, if, you, if you think you've got it, make sure you're wearing a face mask if, if you have to go out. But the key message is stay at home, um, protect the NHS and save lives. And I can't stress how important that is. Um, you've, got to, you've got to make sure that you're staying at home. And if you have got symptoms, stay at home, get somebody else to go and do the shopping sign and access support but the clear message is stay at home if you have any symptoms but a really good question barry and um what we'll do we'll i think we'll pass it on to the mp as well because he might be able to look into that um with the government right uh one for you mike this is from hetty verney i have business clients in siren sister who are not eligible for any government grants are there any grants being offered by cdc uh hello hetty uh no unfortunately there aren't for you uh for businesses uh, it's probably worth saying just to clarify for people uh, that we as a council, we've had the money I talked about earlier for the business grants. That's, uh, we are administering that on behalf of the government. We're paying the money out. But the only actual additional money in, money's in that we've had are £33,000 from the government uh, and £50,000 from Gloucestershire County Council, which we'll be using to support the community resilience work. So no, we don't have any money for businesses other than that, which has been received by the government. Uh, clearly, there's a business rate rebilling exercise which is about to go on once the grants are out as well. Uh, and if that doesn't benefit you, I think I would suggest that's another one for the MP for businesses that need to lobby if they're if they're struggling uh, and are really finding difficulty. Uh, then the government needs to find the money for that because CDC doesn't have it. And as I said earlier, um, Jeffrey Clifton Brown hosts his um, his show, his Q and A on um, on Friday. Um, what time is that? Is that twelve thirty, gents? I'm just looking at my colleagues here. Uh, no, it's three o'clock. Three o'clock. My apologies. So three o'clock um, on on Friday. Um, ask that of of our MP, um, and we'll make sure that we 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 follow up with him as well. Uh, this is from um, Sabrina in Siren Sister. Um, if we are aware of second homes or holiday lets in our communities being occupied by non-residents, should this be reported to the police or to CDC? Lisa. Uh, well, I think uh, this becomes a police issue. Um, I would just like to exercise a little bit of caution. I think it's very important um, whilst we protect uh, our homes and our, our district that we don't get involved in any kind of vigilante or um, hateful... Uh, uh, behaviours. So I think it's clear that if you are concerned, then contact the police and let them deal with it. Okay, Mike, you want to come in? Yeah, I'm the ward member I represent as probably the largest proportion of holiday homes in the whole district. Uh, and what the point I just wanted to make was that uh, there are people that live in those uh, holiday places all year round. So some people don't have another residence to go to. So picking up on the point that, uh, that Lisa just made, some people don't have another home to go back to. So please don't uh, behave in an inappropriate way towards anyone that, uh, that is coming off a holiday place or any of that sort of residence. But yeah, clearly we would like those people to go home if they do have a primary residence elsewhere. But for that, many, of the, many of them, they don't. A question here from Ian Jewell um, on Facebook. Um, as the crews are struggling to keep up on refuse, why not collect every three weeks over the next few months? That way, the crews that are at work um, are not getting burnt out, and when the 12 weeks are up, the rest of the crews can return. Um, and we hope they can, uh, and hopefully things will get back to normal. I think the thing to say is, Ian, we're not, we're not choosing to do that um, at this stage, but 
clearly, depending on our workforce and how stretched the service is, we won't take any options off the table. So at this stage, there are absolutely no plans to do that. But if we were, in a, if we were at a stage where it became absolutely necessary to, we would, of course, consider it. Um, so yeah, at this stage, no plans to do that. But um, we wouldn't take it off the wouldn't take it off the table if we absolutely um, if we absolutely have have to, and I'll also get Councillor Andrew Doherty to follow up on that one um, as well. Uh, I've got one here from 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 Chris Cleal um, in Sirencester. How long will it take for the council to respond to the application for small business cash grants? How long do we leave it before we reach out to CDC um, if we're not hearing about en anything? I think that's talking around obtaining bank information because we don't have information on every business, Mike. Um, I think uh, to Chris, if you've put your application in for the grant, um, as I said, we're endeavouring those who got them in by the end of last week to pay the money out of our account on Friday. So if by the middle of next week you haven't had the money uh, and you have sent us the form and with all the information completed, then that would be an appropriate time to get back in touch. But the, the team are flat out working on getting the grants out. So the more time that they can spend doing that and not asking people ring in asking where's my grant they've got more time to get those grants out to people okay uh we've got a question here from graham parker in siren sister um are the waste food containers being emptied in Apsley road this week uh they didn't come last week um key thing first of all as andy said in the video we saw earlier make sure you report it to the council so we know that there's been a miscollection probably know about it anyway but make sure that you report it just in case i think the second thing leave it out on the curbside if you if the it hasn't been collected um, on the day that you usually get collected. Leave it out, and it should come in the next um, the next day, or or failing that, um, in the few days after. So keep your keep your receptacles on the um, pavement, and they should get picked up as soon um, as possible. Um, right, we've got a question here from Richard Harrison um, on Facebook. Um, given the general advice on the health risk from handling food waste bins, etc., that are left out. Is the clear advice being given to people that they wear protective gloves now when they're putting these out and taking them in? Uh, Richard, I'll be honest, um, I'm not sure. Um, we will get Andrew Doherty to follow up on that. But I think the key thing is when, when anything around waste, make sure that you're being hygienic as a precaution. Yeah, it probably would make sense to, um, to use rubber gloves. I know certainly our, our um, operatives on the ground uh, who work for our waste contractor, they're making sure they're wearing as much protective equipment as is reasonably possible. But I think the key thing is, again, if you've got tissues, if, you know, if, you, if you're suffering from symptoms and you're putting tissues, make sure that they are in the bag, um, sealed up, because um, we don't want to be exposing our um, staff to that. Um, We've got a question here from Jodie Eckersley. So, um, payments for business rates, how long will it take to get into the bank account or is it same day? Mike, I don't know if you'll be able to answer that. No, I think it's uh, two or three days from uh, coming out from us to getting into the, uh, to your account. Thank you very much. Right, we have got, we've got a question here um, from Peter Durney um, in Sirencester. Will the CDC, um, 2020-21 budget or parts be revised, reduced, postponed given the current and ongoing coronavirus emergency, mm -hmm. which will significantly constrain the council's finances going forward. Mike. Yeah, thanks, Peter. A uh, very good question. Obviously, every almost every organisation's budget is currently uh, going to need to be revised uh, given the current situation. So clearly, that's something that I've asked the council officers. I talked about earlier. We know. Uh, we will lose, uh, in terms of revenue terms, at least a third of a million pounds for every month uh, that uh, this situation continues. Uh, and we have a revenue budget of just 24 million pounds. So uh, clearly we need to look at our budget uh, and inevitably we will maybe need to make changes as we go forward. But we're not in that situation yet. Uh, yeah, we are effectively dealing with the crisis. We're, pro we're, we're focusing on providing the key services, uh, housing and homelessness and the waste service and the benefits and the, uh, that I've been talking about. Uh, planning is another service which the government says is essential and we must keep on. So we are keeping our officers and keeping that going. So we're doing all of that. Uh, but And obviously we're looking at how much that is costing us. Uh, where we need to, we might find a little bit of extra money, which we did uh, for a Saturday collection last week. Uh, and we're looking at it very carefully. But yeah, inevitably, we may need to make changes uh, as we uh, come out of this situation. Um, that's something I'll be working very closely with our finance officers on and come back to my colleagues on the council uh, in, due, in due course when, we, when the picture is clearer. 
Thank you, Mike. Um, sorry, Mike, another one for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in demand today. Uh, Rob Caston uh, on Facebook. Um, business rate relief. Do you have to complete a form to receive the 10K grant? Um, this is for those that already have small business rate relief, question mark. Uh, yes, you do, Rob. You need to fill in the form and get it back to us to get the 10,000. That's the grant. The business rate relief, uh, if you're getting that, uh, and for, the, for those who are getting the rate reliefs for retail, hospitality and leisure, uh, those will be automatic because we know which businesses those are and they're currently paying, uh, paying us business rates. But for the grants, you need to fill in the form and get it back to us. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, Lisa. Um, we are coming to the end of um, today's proceedings. Um, again, I want to thank the Barn Theatre for hosting us um, here today. And again, a massive thank you to staff in our NHS, um, to key workers, to council staff. These are the most extraordinary um, times in many of our lifetimes, um, certainly since the Second World War. And I want to pay tribute to everybody across the Cotswolds. I think what we have shown over the past few weeks and months is we've got a fantastic community spirit right up and down the Cotswolds in every corner of our large district. I want to pay tribute to everybody who is supporting a neighbour, getting involved and generally doing all they can to try and help the effort. As I said a few weeks ago, my colleagues and I expected no less. We knew it existed, but what this crisis has done has absolutely magnified that. So thank you to everybody um, mucking in to help in their communities. We'll be here next week and we'll be keeping you frequently up to date. And we'll be back by popular demand. A number of people have been in touch to, um, to say, are we going to be continuing these? And we're going to certainly be continuing these um, while the coronavirus crisis has, um, continues. And we'll be trying to keep you as update and informed and answer as many of, you, of your questions um, as possible. But folks, thank you very much for tuning in. In the words of Her Majesty the Queen, we will meet again soon and we can't wait for that day to come. But in the meantime, we're here to support you. Please reach out to us if you need our support. Thank you very much.